thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wait to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The see, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. Sure, there's always room for one more. Well, in their search for the Upsidesium mine, our heroes have finally got to Mount Flatten, the world's only floating mountain. But Bullwinkle, who unearthed a large boulder of the anti-gravity metal, soon found himself falling upward at remarkable speed. I always expected to go to heaven, but not so soon. Drop it, Bullwinkle! I can't, Rocky. I'm too high up. It was true. Bullwinkle shot higher and higher, and truly he was in a dilemma. Yeah, I dasn't hold on, and I dasn't let go. Then the brainy squirrel got an idea... If you still have your pick with you, just break some pieces off the rock. And Bullwinkle did just that. And with each piece he chipped off, his upward speed slowed and slowed until finally he actually began to move downward again. Don't chip any more, Bullwinkle. That's just right. Boy, keeping that stuff is going to be harder than getting it. You know, I have the same trouble with money. Meanwhile, far below them, those two sneaky characters, Boris and Natasha, still disguised as miners, were now hatching still another plot to steal Mount Platten and spirit it away to Potsylvania. You're sure this will work, Boris? How could it don't work? Was invented by Uncle Wanya himself. Uncle Wanya? That grand old mean of crime. You mean grand old man of crime. <laughs> I said mean, I mean mean. Look here. And Boris showed Natasha one of his rarest treasures, an autographed copy of Uncle Vanya's collected recipes for robbers, the Fireside Crook Book. See right here, he tells how to steal mountain. Take fan A, up in balloon B, turn it on mountain C. Then wind blows mountain where you want it. Clever. You sure Uncle Wanya did it? Of course, it says right here. This plan is absolutely sure. Come. And the two villains followed the instructions to the letter. Okay. Turn on fan, Natasha. Sure enough, the huge fan blade spun at frightening speed, sending out a whirlwind of air. But unfortunately, the balloon was lighter than the mountain, and so... Boy, fan is blowing us away! Turn it off, Natasha! Off, off! I can't, darling! Switch is stuck! Oh, boy! And the balloon continued to dart madly about the sky. Hey, Bullwinkle, isn't that Mojave Max and Death Valley Dottie? Yeah! That's a mighty strange-looking balloon they're in. First time I ever seen one with an outboard motor. I thought this plan was absolutely sure. Says right here, absolutely sure. Third page, darling. To fail miserably. Well, <laughs> that's one on you, Natasha. And uh, here's one on you, darling. <laughs> but Natasha's fun was interrupted when a voice crackled from their radio. Come in, Boris Bedinov, whoever you are. The central control. Bedinov here, the schnook you love to hate. Available for wars, feuds, and all kinds of dirty deals. Go ahead. Bedinov, Mount Flatten is too big for you to handle. Too, too big? Someone is coming to take over. Take over? Stop repeating everything I say. Everything you... Yes, fearless leader. Uh, just who is coming to take over? Who else? Mr. Big. M -m Mr. Big? 
That is all. Over and out, Badenov. He certainly is, darling. And at that very moment, a jet black jet is roaring toward Mount Flatten. Its passenger, Mr. Big. Be with us next time for Boris Bites Back or A Rebel Without a Pause. Once upon a time there was a little kingdom named the Kingdom of Fig, in which there was a castle, in which there was a throne room, in which there was a king named Newton. I thought you'd never get here. This particular day the king was busy planning one week's dinner menu with the castle cook. How about a nice serosa beef, your highness? Had that last Sunday. I fix a nice suckling a pig with apple in his mouth. No, I like suckling pig, but suckling pig doesn't like me. How about a chili beans and a chocolate malt? Well, you're getting warmer, but no, no. Uh, how about a roast chicken? Sorry, we don't got a chicken in the palace. Roast turkey? No turkeys in the palace. Roast goose? No goose. We only got the one. Well, mm-hmm. let's have it. But, your highness, uh, she's a kind of a palace pet. A million laughs. <coughs> Stuff and nonsense. If she laid golden eggs or something, it'd be different. But she looks to me just like an eating-type goose. Pop her in the oven. Okay, highness. I make preparations right away. <coughs> hey, Monroe! Well, of course, the goose was terrified, so she did the only thing she could think of. She ran. But just before she reached the castle gate, she stopped and thought of what lay beyond it. Four thousand hungry peasants! I can't go out there! But just then, the words of the king came back to her. If she laid golden eggs, it'd be different. If she laid golden eggs, golden eggs... Golden eggs, of course. A moment later, the goose dashed into the kitchen, got a regular egg, and quickly painted it gold. That evening at dinner, when the main course was brought in, the king got quite a surprise. Hi, Highness. That's a good one, eh? <coughs> good heavens! Cook! Yes, Your Majesty. This goose is terribly underdone. Put her back in the oven. Hold it, sire. Take a look at this. It looks like a golden egg. Looks like. Here, take a closer peek at it. Fourteen carat. She's a done it, Your Highness. You got a goose that lays a golden eggs. Well, upon my word. Yes. <laughs> the trick had worked like a charm. News of the king's good fortune spread like wildfire. X3! Local goose lays golden egg! King Newton of Fig hits jackpot! Matter of fact, the news spread a little too far, as it reached the eyes of the king's cousin, Duke Porkington of Hogg. Hmm. A thing like this is too big for Newton to handle. It must worry him terribly. I'll just relieve him of the responsibility. To arms! And the greedy duke marched on his cousin's castle to take the wonderful goose by force. When King Newton heard about it, he spoke those deathless words by which we remember him even today. Don't give up the goose! Yeah! but King Porkington was determined. Day after day, he blasted at the castle. You know, Your Grace, you may kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. If I can't have it, nobody can, see? But by then, King Newton's castle was shot away. Uh, why aren't we shooting back? We are the cannonballs, Majesty. All we can do now is to sit and take it. Golden eggs. I wish I'd never heard of golden eggs. Me too. In fact, I'm going to get rid of this one right now. No, sire, don't throw it! <laughs> Some yo- uh, joke, eh, Majesty? Even fool you, eh? <laughs> funny, funny! <laughs> Shall I go get in the oven, sire? But instead of being angry, the king jumped with joy. You're a fraud! <laughs> a phony! You can't do it! Well, I was just... Well, I can tell Porkington that I don't have anything he wants. He'll go away. But just then, a very strange thing happened. Sire, may I have some pickles and ice cream? Of course, I'll go... Pickles and ice cream? Or maybe a little sauerkraut topped with strawberries? Are you feeling all right? Just a little faint. What is it? Nothing. I'm just going to lay an egg, that's all. And she did. But what an egg it was. It's so shiny. It looks like 
Solid gold. And it was solid gold. Well, that drops a clod in the churn. Now I can never call off Parkington. But, sire, now we don't have to. Well, what do you mean? I have a plan. And a moment later, as Duke Parkington prepared to storm the castle, a shot rang out and a strange cannonball landed at his feet. Look, Your Grace, it's solid gold. Gold cannonballs. Boy! Here comes another one. Catch it, catch it. Well, of course, when the soldiers tried to catch the golden cannonballs, they were mowed down in rows. And in a little while, Duke Parkington stood alone on the battlefield. Are you going on with the battle? No, Newton. Just picking up souvenirs. So the King Newton and the Goose lived happily ever after and whiled away the time playing games together. I'll bet five. I'll just see that, Majesty, and raise you ten. <laughs> Private Bullwinkle, sir, with a message. Just in time. Is it important? Is it? Just look. And here he is, that master of misinformation, Mr. Know-it-all. Hi ho, culture fans. Today's little lecture is entitled How to Be a Barber or Ten Ways to Clip Your Fellow Man. The successful barber needs the following essential items. First, a red and white striped barber pole. Bullwinkle, that pole is black and white and checkered. Hmm. Maybe that's why business has been so bad. The second necessity is the pair of scissors, which must be sharp as a razor. <clears throat> sharp as a razor, Bullwinkle? An electric razor. It won't cut paper either. Last and, of course, most important, a victim... A customer. Do I see a volunteer? Sorry, I'm late for engagement to Bomb Playground. How about you, Captain Peach Fuzz? I'd like to, Bullwinkle, but I've got to go get a haircut. Some other time... Hmm? Well, old buddy boy, that seems to narrow it down to you. Yeah, well, maybe just a trim, okay? Sure. You want a type A trim or a type B trim? Well, what's a type A trim? That's the kind Yule Brynner got. Yule Brynner? Well, who got type B? Here he is. General Custer. Um, I think I'll be a long hair instead, but I'll give you a little tip, Bullwinkle. Well, that's mighty nice of you. Get into some other business, quick. Sure, but, uh... What about the tip? That was it. And thank you, Mr. Know-it-all. You're uh, welcome. Ooh. Mm. There, Peabody and Sherman here. I oiled the Wayback Machine like you told me, Mr. Peabody. And just in time, Sherman, because we have a date with one of America's greatest patriots. Ponsonby Britt? Uh, no, Sherman. This patriot made a historic ride on the night of April 18th, 1775, and the man in question, Paul Revere. Without any further ado, the Wayback Machine teleported us back to Paul Revere's copper shop. Inside, we found not Mr. Revere, but rather Mrs. Can I help you? Well, yes, madam. We should like to speak to your husband. So would I. He hasn't been inside the shop for three days. All he does is sit on that horse and back, waiting for the British to come. We wasted no time in joining the eager coppersmith. Don't stand too close, boys. As soon as I see the lanterns, I'm off to warn Lexington. But, Mr. Revere, your horse... No time for idle conversation, lad. I've got some riding to do. But you don't understand. One if by land, two if by sea, one if by land... Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Revere, Mr. Revere, I feel it only fair to warn you that unless you change horses, you won't be riding anywhere. Eh, uh, what are you talking about? You are sitting on a statue. Say, how about that? I was wondering why he didn't eat much hay. Mr. Peabody, there's a light in the tower. Sure enough, Sherman had spotted the signal. How many lanterns, boy? One or two? Three. They must be coming both by land and by sea. Step back. I gotta warn the country. Giddy up, boy. Giddy up. Mr. Revere, the statue, remember? Eh? Oh, yeah. oh yes. Yeah. Sure was a quiet horse, though. I sent Sherman to search the town for another horse. This hog was the only animal I could find, Mr. Peabody. Well, you can't expect me to ride that, can you? You have no alternative. Why don't I try to start this statue? You never know. It may run. And with that, Paul Revere begged, 
pleaded, even tried to bribe his favorite horse. Yes, it ain't no use. I guess the hog'll have to do. Unfortunately, the hog was as contrary as the statue. Golly, Mr. Peabody, he won't budge. And I gotta get to Lexington to warn the people. Hmm. Now, what would cause a hog to run? I have it. Mr. Revere, the magic words are hog fat. Hog fat? Look at him go! Yes. No hog wants to be turned into hog fat. Well, I guess we can go home now that Mr. Revere's on his way. I'm afraid not, Sherman. You see, Paul Revere just went north. Lexington is south. Well, by now, there were five lanterns in the tower, so the situation, as you could see, was desperate. Sherman and I headed for Lexington as fast as we could. And speaking of Lexington, a certain American general, who shall be nameless, was in town spearheading an enlistment drive. I tell you, we need soldiers. And Lexington is proud to do its part, General. Proud? You mean you're proud of one old man and two dogs? The dogs we can use, but the old man... Uh, forgive the intrusion, gentlemen, but we're here to tell you the British are coming. Oh, did you see him? No, but we saw the lanterns. Well, then you mean the lanterns are coming, not the British. We mean the British are coming. Oh, I'm sorry, but the only way I'll believe that is when Paul Revere tells me. Now, about those two dogs... But Paul Revere may not get here until it's too late, Mr. Peabody. He may never get here, Sherman. Mm. Ah, I have it. Uh, pardon me, General, but I understand you need soldiers. I sure do. Well, I don't know whether you're familiar with New England customs, but up here, the only way to get soldiers is to issue the Boston Back Bay Battle Cry. I don't think I know it. Oh, it's quite simple, sir. You merely shout the word suey. Suey? Suey. Well, one minute later, the hills surrounding Lexington were reverberating with that famous old hog call. Suey! 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 Inside of a quarter of an hour, every hog in the vicinity was thundering down Lexington's main street, and among them was our hog fat hog carrying Paul Revere. The British are coming! The British and the hogs are coming! Golly, Mr. Peabody, what a brilliant idea! Yes, wasn't it? That battle cry was an inspiration. So far, we've signed up 420 men. Oh, I tell you, it was unbelievable. I gave that yell in exactly 60 seconds. We had a line. Would you call them 60-second men, Mr. Peabody? Of course not, Chairman. I'd call them minute men. If you think you have troubles, just listen to this. Rocky and Bullwinkle have discovered a rich load of upsidasium on Mount Flatten, but because upsidasium falls up, they can't hang on to any of it. Besides that, Boris and Natasha are still going through the rogues' recipes and the fireside crookbook to discover a way to steal the whole floating mountain. And besides that, a deadly black jet is streaking their way, bearing the sinister figure of Boris's boss, Mr. Big. And besides that... And besides that, the episode is half over already. We gotta figure out how to hold on to our upsidasium, Bullwinkle. Yeah, I know everything's going up these days, but this is just silly. We need somebody who knows all there is to know about mining. Hey, what about asking Mojave Max? Good idea, Bullwinkle. And our trusting heroes started off to find Mojave Max, who in reality was their worst enemy, Boris Badenov. Well, how you be, partner? You find mine yet? Yep, and we need your help with it, Mr. Mac. What's the trouble? Well, this obsidian stuff falls up. So? So what do we keep it in? Hmm, that is problem. Let's take Squint on mine. And our heroes led Boris and Natasha right to their obsidasium mine. This is main chef? That's right. The problem is simple. It is? Sure. You go to bottom of shaft and soon all your troubles will be over. Great. And our heroes began letting themselves down the mine elevator. That Mojave Max seems like a good sort. Yeah. A good sort of what? If Bullwinkle had only been at the top of the shaft, he would have known what. Boris, what you doing with crowbar? Well, I'm not barring cross on you, bum. <laughs> Lend a hand. The two rascals rolled an enormous stone closer and closer to the shaft. And this rock falls down. 
D-O-U-N-E, -E, down. Meanwhile, Rocky and Bullwinkle were dropping deeper and deeper into the mine. Sure got dark all of a sudden. Something must be blocking the sunlight. Uh-oh, it sure is. Looky. It's a great big rock coming down at us. Again? Rocky, do you suppose we're accident prone? No time to worry about that. Let go of the rope. But we'll fall. Sure, our only chance is to stay ahead of that falling rock for as long as we can. And as Bullwinkle let go of the lift cable, the platform dropped faster and faster. Above them, the huge stone plummeted down like a... Uh, like a stone. Like a stone. Are we gaining on it? It's about even, Bullwinkle. Good. Only one thing worries me. What's that? What happens when we get to the bottom of the shaft? I hate to think, Bullwinkle. We gotta figure out something, Rock. I don't want to wind up as a mess of moose butter. At the top of the shaft, Boris was feeling very proud of himself. Natasha, you ever have one of those days where everything is wrong? Yes. Isn't it wonderful? But Boris, darling, Mr. Big is coming. You're not nervous? Mr. Big, phooey. When that creepy joy gets here, Mount Flatten will be gone. Gone? Gone where? Gone with us. We hijack Mount Boris, you're going to double-cross Mr. Big? With moose and squirrel gone is easy. What kind of schnook you take me for? I give up, Badinov. What kind? Boris, look there. That huge shadow on the rock. No, not that. Yes, that. It's Mr. Big. And meanwhile, our boys are just seconds away from complete disaster. Don't miss our next episode, Bullwinkle at the Bottom or Mishmash Moose. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop! <laughs> Right. Bye now. See you next time.